morning and welcome to another show of the Veterans Forum. As you know, we are coming from the studios of Pittsfield Community Television here in Frederica Drive in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. For the record, uh, today is the 26th of March, 2008. And as usual, we have another real good story that people will want to share and share with you. Today's guest, volunteer, and old friend <laughs> is Dick Smith. For the record, would you tell us your name, please? Spell your last name and <laughs> give us your dates of service. You want me to give you the AKA, also known well, as? Or whatever. <laughs> it, we only have an hour show, so not all of it's, them. My name is Richard Smith, and uh, I'm from Pittsfield. And uh, the last name is S M I T H. <laughs> okay. And your dates of service, please. Uh, from uh, April 1944 uh, to, to uh, June 46. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank uh, you. Sometime and then. Sometime, you know, yeah. In and around. <laughs> yeah. As you can see, this is going to be a good show, you think? Mm -hmm. No. So, so if we set the stage, though, Dick, can you go back and, and uh, if you will, where were you born, when were you born, and what kind of a, a childhood did you have? Any brothers and sisters, and what was his life like back in the early days, well, in your mind? I, I, was, I was born in February 1926, and uh, born in Pittsfield, I lived in Pittsfield all my life. I only had two addresses in Pittsfield, that's with 23 Beach Grove Avenue, and my address today is 264 Gale Avenue, Pittsfield. It's the only two places I ever lived, except when I worked for the Navy. But as a kid growing up, I, I had a real good childhood. I hated school. I hated school from the first day that I went. I lived two doors away from Pomeroy School. I was late all the time, but the first <laughs> day I went to school, I skipped. My mother took and dropped me off at the north door, and she said, be a good boy, behave yourself when you come home at lunch, don't sass the teachers, and I said, no, mama. And so she dropped me off at the north door, I walked through the school, went out the south door, and I, that was the first day, and I quit, and I hated school from that day on. I never liked school at all. And I finally quit school when I was in the middle of my junior year at uh, Pittsfield High. And uh, I was 16, and my father said, you either go to school or go to work. I said, I'll go to work. I don't want to go to school. And eventually I ended up going in the Navy. Mm -hmm. I had a real good childhood. I got crazy about airplanes, even when I was a little kid. I would see a plane go over that I didn't know about, and I didn't realize who it was. I'd jump on my bicycle, and I'd pedal all the way out to Pittsfield Airport. I'd see what the plane was, and then some of the old pilots would be sitting around <laughs> under the wings of their plane in the shade and everything, and they'd say, hey, kid, go over and wipe my plane down and give you a ride. So you'd be surprised how many planes I <laughs> used yeah. to wipe down over a period of time. But that's how I really got my start with aviation. And then uh, in 1942, I was 16. I took flying lessons at the Loughberry Flying School in Great Barrington, Mass. Mm -hmm and I got my student pilot's license. In fact, I soloed in the wintertime on skis. And that kept me in the aviation business. Good, good start. Yeah. I went to the Navy, I had to go to boot camp out in Sampson. I got out of boot camp and went to OGU in Newport, Rhode Island. And they, there was some <laughs> young yeoman there sitting at the desk, and I think his father was a politician. I don't think he ever moved off that seat all during the war. But anyway, <laughs> he said to me, you're going in the armed guard. I said, armed guard? He said, yeah. I said, what do you mean armed guard? He said, well, they, they put uh, sailors on the merchant ships, and they, uh, they operate the artillery and everything on the merchant ships. And he said, they're on the Murmansk run then. I said, well, I'm scared to death of water, deep cold water. water. <laughs> so I didn't want to go there. So I said, why are you going to send me there? I said, I'm a pilot. I'm a pilot. He said, well, what do you fly? I said, I can fly anything. I said, I can fly a P-38, a B-47. I said, I can fly anything. I said, here's my pilot's license. And I held my thumb over the word that said student. Oh. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, fuck, yeah. Well, he says, you don't qualify for, for pilot training. He says, you don't have the education or anything. He said, maybe we could send you to gunnery school. I said, yeah, that's, that's good. And I was right next to Quonset Point. So <laughs> that's good for me. Well, to shorten the story up, I went up to gunnery school and I started there. But because of my eyesight at that particular time, I didn't qualify. So they said, well, you're going on the Bennington. So I went down to... Uh, 
Brooklyn Navy Yard. They were just built, finishing the Bennington, building the Bennington. And I went aboard the Bennington, and then when I got aboard, uh, I eventually got uh, attached to uh, Air Group 82. There was Air Group 82 was a torpedo group, bombing group, and fighter group. And I was with a torpedo group, and I became a plane captain on a TBM Avenger, and that's what I did all during the war. Oh. Now, when you went aboard, uh, you were one of the commissioning crew, weren't you? Where, where and when was the Bennington really in, uh, in Brooklyn, up? Brooklyn Navy Bro Yard. Okay, Brooklyn when? Navy Yard. <coughs> yeah, and to digress briefly, which I probably, probably will from time to time, but uh, I was a plank owner because I was on the ship when it was commissioned. Commissioned crew, yeah. Yeah, and I went to the 50th reunion in Bennington, Vermont, and uh, one of the fellows said to me, he said, you were a plank owner? I said, yeah. And he said, uh, well, you get a piece of the plank? I said, no, I never got a piece of the plank. He said, you want a piece? And I said, yeah. So oh. I said, how do I do it? So I received this letter from a man by the name of Rupert Marshall. And he said, dear Dick, here's the information. You get a piece of the plank. Write to H.A. Vandis, Curator Branch, Naval Historical Center, Washington, D.C. You must send a copy of your plank owner's certificate or available something appropriate. And they will guarantee that they'll send you a piece of the plank, a piece of the USS Bennington original plank. So anyway, they did, they did <coughs> send me a piece of the plank. And uh, also this piece of steel on there is actually a piece of the steel that they were working on welding or whatever. And there was a piece cut out with a cutting torch. And I grabbed a hold of it after it cooled off. And I put it in my pocket and I brought it back after. But uh, the Bennington was commissioned August 6, 1944, and I have a piece of the plank. Come here, I'll hold that sure. and see if Carol can get a real good shot of that, okay? I'm a good holder up. There you go. <laughs> That's good. Well, the CB supported the Navy, you know. Yes. <laughs> there you go, folks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Carol. And there's the piece that Dick borrowed, if you will. He had some deep pockets. He's done, <laughs> borrowed quite a few things from here and there. All right. Thank you. All right, sir. Well, how'd you get into the air part of it as far as you were Torpedo squadron? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I was a, well. Yes, I I did uh, when I got became a member of Air Group 82, and then they assigned me to VT 82, which was a torpedo group, and I was uh, I was assigned to uh, a Grumman TBF Avenger, and that was my job. I was responsible for that airplane, for anything that had to be done to it. I had to be sure that I was the last person that gave it a thumbs up before it took off. Okay, now that I propped a tail hook then. Propped a tail hook, right. And even the tail hook, you had to make sure that was yeah. working. But, <laughs> it slows you down quite but a bit. It, uh, <clears throat> I, I was responsible for everything, and I, I do mean everything because, you know, your, your gas and oil and all this kind of stuff, and your hydraulics and your electric, and then all your armament. You were responsible for loading of the bombs, loading of the torpedo, loading of the machine guns of 50 calibers and whatever else, making sure that the turret in the back uh, operated all right and that particular weapon was a 50 caliber and I had to be sure that that was in good shape. And uh, my responsibility was after the two combat, there were three people on that airplane. There were two combat air crewmen and one pilot. And uh, the last thing I did is when the pilot came up, he, uh, he only had a tin bucket seat to sit in, but he sat on his parachute. And uh, when he'd come up, I would make sure that his, all his straps were hooked up, his belt strap and everything else. And then I got down, gave him the whirl, and if the uh, uh, engine turned up good with no barking, then I just gave him the thumbs up and off he went. It was, it was my responsibility. And the hardest part of that particular job was waiting for that plane to come back and that all the people are safe. 
You know. that, that was the hardest part of the job. But. Just like a mother or a father waiting for the kids <laughs> in the high school dance, you hear that front door closed, I, I, I know. then you've done your job. Yeah, now I that know. must have taken a lot of time to, to train all the different systems. You must have gone to all kinds of oh, schooling yeah, yeah, and what have you. Yeah, yeah. Any yeah, of it that really uh, stood out as yeah. far as being important? Or it, I know it's all important, but yeah, some of the things yeah, you had to pay yeah, real yeah. attention to. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a 24-hour day job. I mean, it's, you know, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, the ship's uh, uh, nomenclature was uh, A, B, and C. The A part of the ship was the bow, the C was at the fantail, but B was in the center. And any deck below the hangar deck was one, two, three, four. But any deck above the hangar deck was O one, O two, O three. And my sleeping compartment was B O one twenty seven L L for living. And that's where I slept whenever I had a chance and we got a GQ to go out general quarters. Then I'd have to go out, I'd grab the handrail, I would slide down go down to the hangar deck if that's where my plane was, or if it was on the flight deck at that particular time, then I had to take another stairway and just go up to the, the flight deck. But I, I was only between the two decks, one way or the other. And probably the, the job on the flight deck was probably the most, I'd say the most dangerous yeah. place to be. than any. You had those yeah. silly things called propellers. Uh, I had the sad occasion to see two people go through the propellers and one pilot came out and he just took the engines because we had to we had to turn their engines over, you know, before they came mm -hmm. out. We had to make sure they're all warm and whatever. Didn't happen to my plane, but this pilot came out and he just tried to slide between the tail of one plane and he fell back into the prop of another. Another kid was pulling chalks and he walked into a prop, but that's that's the sad part of it. Now, we see a lot of these uh, World War II movies of all the figures and the guys running back and forth. Did you have any special colored uh, your t shirt, uniform? Oh, I was a brown Everybody, shirt. Okay. I was a brown shirt. <laughs> brown shirt. Because every, every color had yeah. a specific job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And my good friend, uh, Steve Perry, he, uh, he was a green shirt. He was on the Intrepid, but uh, not during wartime. I said, what'd you do, Steve? He says, oh, he says, I was in catapult arresting gear. I said, oh, you were a green shirt. He said, how'd you know that? Yeah. <laughs> I said, I was a brown shirt. He said, you were? I said, yeah. He said, yeah. yeah. Well, when you went aboard and had your shakedown, where, where did you go? From Brooklyn up or down the North Atlantic? Yeah, Pacific, yeah. South we, we went out to, uh, we <clears throat> went out to uh, Trinidad for, for our shakedown. Oh. Then we came back from Trinidad, and then we went down uh, to Norfolk, Virginia, went to Oceana Beach, and then from there went down to Panama Canal, went out to Panama Canal, out to San Diego, and and we left from there and went from there to, to Honolulu. And uh, Honolulu, we went to Ford Island. I met a guy, I was probably down there maybe oh, a couple of weeks because we were taking on armament, whatever else, before we headed out for Ulithia out in the Bonin Islands. And this friend of mine, he says, hey, you like to fly? He says, yeah. He says, he says, uh, uh, I got a chance to go on a B-26 somewhere. You want to go? I said, sure, sure, free ride. We'd love to, you know, just, just to take a ride. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so I got a couple, couple of chances to go out with, with him out there. But our commander of our torpedo squadron, Bill Eady, he, he was killed down in, uh, in Hawaii, not in a battle. He was, he was in an accident. Mm. But anyway, he was killed, so we got another commander for our torpedo squadron. And I think in, in my diary that, that oh, it was probably 10 days or so we're out at sea. We buried him at sea and whatever. He had a new commander. Yeah. Mm. Now, uh, you said diary, but if I remember correctly, one of the rules of war, you're not supposed to have a diary. Is that right? I, I, I never knew it's, that. It's very vague. I never knew. You'd be surprised how many <laughs> guys just happen to have I, cuff I, notes, you know, best way to get through high school, a lot I, of cuffs. This, Show us this. This, uh, this, this is the, uh, the size of the diary that, that I was keeping. And my, my older no, son, older. I have five sons and three daughters, but... Anyway, my oldest son down in North Carolina, he said, uh, I told him about the diary, and I only found it just a short while ago. So I told him about it. He said, Dad, send it down to me. And he said, I'd like to take and, uh, and see if I could do something. So he took each page out of the diary, 
and he put it in there. Now he says that what I should do is get on the computer or something and print that all out on the computer so other people can read the diary. And uh, Bob and I were at the same place on uh, Easter Sunday, uh, 1945, April 1st. That was April yeah, 1st. April Fool's Day. It was April Fool's Day. And you know, the night before March 31st, I wrote in that diary, uh, tomorrow's the big day. I didn't know whether I said that because it was Easter Sunday or, or it was April Fool's, Jap uh, April Fool's Day on our enemy. But anyway, I wrote in the diary, uh, tomorrow is Easter. I remember when I was a little kid, my mother used to take my two brothers and myself down to the store and buy us some new clothes so we could go to church on Easter Sunday dressed up. And I said, here I am in an old per pair of dirty, greasy dungarees I probably had on for the last two weeks. And, but that remind me of what Christmas or Easter was. But it's all it's all in my yeah. diary. <laughs> We're going to get that done somehow. And as a suggestion, when you get it done, have it copyrighted. You never know. You could probably, if you will, send yeah. it to no, some place. Well, it, you know, a magazine or yeah, that, that is. a movie out of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Now, we talk about Easter. Some of the eggs that you had, or you guys loaded, they, they weren't the hard-boiled type, were they? No, not really. No, no. We, uh, <laughs> we used everything. You know, we used napalm. In those, in the fighter planes used napalm. And uh, this, uh, this pilot came back one day, and he says, well, he said, I had a napalm sandwich. What do you mean a napalm salad sandwich? He says, you know, he said, I had a sandwich, and he said, I put it in the cockpit alongside of me, and he said, I went into a dive, and when I pulled out, he said, that sandwich came right up and hit me. <laughs> Free flow. And I there. says, why? He says, I was just dropping napalm at the same time. He says, oh, I called it a napalm sandwich. <laughs> yeah. But they were they were good people, the good guys to work with. Yeah. And now, prior to uh, Okinawa, backing up a bit, what were some of your, if you were pre-Okinawa ships, after you left Ulithi and Mogmog, the, the Beer Island and well, that kind of place? Well, okay. You go? Now, <coughs> let's, let's go back to the latter part of 44. Okay. We're there. We, we were in the first carrier strikes on Tokyo since Doolittle. Now, Doolittle went out on the Hornet with the B-25s, and he made the strikes on Tokyo carrier strikes, mm -hmm. but we were the first aircraft carrier strike with carrier planes that, that hit Tokyo in 44, late of 45, 44. And then in February of 45, uh, we went to Chichijima. Now that was prior to going to Iwo Jima. And Chichijima, the Japanese, had a very sophisticated communications outfit, and they wanted to knock it out. And it was on an island, and there was like two mo two mountains in between, or between two mountains. So we went in. It was the Bennington, the Hornet, and the San Jacinto. And they had the raids. And when they uh, they went in, two of our air crewmen, combat air crewmen, on a TBM, Bob King was the pilot, Lieutenant Bob King, and they got shot up real bad. And he said to the boys, he says. It might be a chance for you to bail out while we have the altitude, the altitude, and he says, and I will crash land into the sea. So they bailed out. And uh, Warren Vaughn, Warren Earl, was a Marine pilot. He was with VMF 123, uh, which was on our, our ship, and they were flying Corsairs, and Warren Vaughn got shot down as well in that same raid. And that same raid also. Another pilot on the San Jacinto got shot down, and uh, he was an Avenger pilot, and he uh, he got picked up by a submarine. And I can tell you a little bit later that a lot of people know who he was. But anyway, Jimmy Dye, that was on February 18, 45, and February 29, 45, we got word that Jimmy Dye and Grady York had been captured. All we knew on the 18th oh, the was crew. that they were the yeah. two crewmen that bailed out. <clears throat> and then we we read that, uh, or we, we got notice. I put it in my di uh, my diary there that uh, Bob King brought the plane back that day. It was plane number 113. 
and uh, he brought it back. He crash landed, and, and they, a tin can picked him up, and brought him back to the ship. But later on, the story of the book Flyboys. My son sold me. My older son in North Carolina sent me that book for a Christmas present. I don't know, maybe three years ago or so. And I said, well, that's nice. It's about naval aviation. I like naval aviation. I let yeah. it grow with that. I said, someday I'll sit down and read it. So my wife picked it up, and she always starts at the back and goes to forward. Oh, yeah. I want to know how yeah. it is before yeah. board it <laughs> Well, I like it when I get to the yeah. end. <laughs> so, so she went to the back of the book, and she says, hey, she says, uh, you know Rowdy Dow? I says, yeah. I says, he's in this book. I said, no kidding. She says, yeah. She said, George Flashner, he's in this book, too. I said, yeah. that right? I says, yeah. I said, uh, Vince Carnazza, is he in that book? Yeah. I says, I got to read it. Amen. So that's by James Bradley. So I read the book. It's about Torpedo Squadron 82. It's about the Battle of Chichijima. It's about the story of uh, Jimmy Dye and Grady York, Warren Vaughn. In fact, their pictures are in that book. That they not only were captured by the Japanese after they bailed out, but they were later bayoneted and beheaded. And uh, so we we found out about that. And I see George Flashner every once in a while. And George was also a combat air crewman. And uh, so he tells me a lot of stories about, about those boys because he, he was closer to them than anybody. But that's, and by the way, that uh, James Bradley's father, John Bradley, did not want to go in the Army and live in a foxhole, so he joined the Navy. They made him a corpsman and put him on Iwo Jima, <laughs> and he was one of the six flag raisers. Oh, for He God was one God. of the three to come back. Three of the, three of the boys were killed on, uh, on Iwo Jima at the time, and he was one of the three to come so back. So a lot of history yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah. Well, after you left there, where else did you, because you've got all kinds of good oh, stuff Oh, yeah, well, there. okay, we, we left Chichijima, and uh, we continued on down to Iwo Jima. So we spent a few days in there. We were supporting the attack on, uh, on Iwo Jima, and then uh, we headed down to Okinawa. And we got to Okinawa, as you know better than anybody, that uh, April 1st was April Fool's Day, and it was Easter Sunday. And uh, they were supposed to be out of there in two weeks. We got smashed up in a typhoon. Oh, that yeah. was sometime in June. <laughs> sometime in June we were still there. And our good friend George Flashner, who was a combat air crewman, I said, George, where were you on uh, February 7, 1945? Or April 7, April 7, 1945. He said, I don't know. I'd have to look at my logbook. I said, when did you go after the Yamato? Oh yeah, he yeah. said that was one of the that was Not one so. of the roughest cruise uh, trips that I was ever yeah. on. He and Torpedo 82 plus other other planes they went out. They sank the prize of the Japanese battleship Yamato, and they took the Yamato out of Yokosuka Navy Yard. It only had enough fuel to go one way, one way, and it was going to Okinawa, and they planned to beach it at Okinawa and use their 18-inch guns as field artillery to fight in that battle, but George and the rest of the boys sank it before it got, yeah. <laughs> it got Damn there. Damn good thing. Yeah. It looked like the Germans used the 88s as yeah. uh, anti-personnel. Yeah. And when they did it, they did a heck yeah. of a job yeah. on you. Yeah. yeah. Now tell them about the, the bow down that you guys suffered in the uh, typhoon. You know, yeah, I think... Uh, you got it one here someplace. Yeah, I just, I just wondering where it was. Well, uh, Dick is looking up stuff. Some of you may remember I had Erin Coria uh, as a volunteer and as an interviewer a while ago, and uh, George Fleischer that we were talking about uh, did a real good interview with uh, Dick Nichols up at the Dalton Cable Access Place. And the irony is, these three guys now know each other. They live within maybe five miles in any direction, but up to a few weeks ago, some of them never knew the other one existed. So we're getting to be a family, if you will, and anybody else that's on the Essex or anybody else, come on in, we'll talk about it. It'll be fun.
No. I'll uh, I'll come across that uh, picture okay. somewhere here, Bob. But uh, this is this is a newspaper clipping that my mother clipped out of the uh, <laughs> the Eagle. That was my job. But the, read read to him. I will. Who, I just want to let Carol get a good yeah. shot of this yeah. thing. There he is. Young, slender, curly-haired, and wild-eyed. Let me read what's on the side here. This is kind of funny. Richard Smith uh, is in a ceremony. Richard Smith, 20, that's your age, not your... I was an old man by yeah. then. Aviation uh, mate, first class, United States Navy, and Mr. and Mrs. Raymond Smith of Beach Grove Avenue participated in ceremonies aboard the aircraft carrier USS Bennington at Pearl Harbor when Admiral John Towers, USN, relieved Admiral Spruance, USN, as Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Smith's primary job aboard the carrier is to serve as plane captain of the new Admiral's airplane. The Pittsfield man entered the service two years ago and has served aboard the Bennington since it was commissioned in 1944. The Benningtons are extensive service with the famed Third Fleet in the Pacific. The carrier took part in the carrier-borne strikes against Tokyo Bay Area and other assaults against the Japanese homeland, Chichijima, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. Wow. This is, uh, that's what happened to our ship in that okay, typhoon. This, we, we'll see. We've got to get it somehow. <laughs> if you know anything about a carry, it's got a pretty good bow. This one looks like the nose of a rhinoceros. <laughs> they were hit by the typhoon off Okinawa. And those of you who have been there know that was the wettest place in the world to be for many, many, many a week. See it right here, down there. Now, when you were, well, I'll say, rescued or towed back, where did, you, where did they send the tug to get you from? No, they, we, we, uh, we left there, we left Okinawa, we went to the Philippines, down the Lady Gulf. And, oh, okay. uh, and I always said, oh, and that, at that, excuse me, that was in June of 45, and uh, our Air Group 82 left the George Flashers Group. They left and went back to the States. And then we had to go over to an island by the name of Samar and pick up more airplanes that they brought in on a jeep carrier. And then we had to fly them out to our, our ship after they cut the bow off. They cut about 40 feet off the bow. That went back out to sea and then we flew out to go aboard. And I always said, well, I said the only award that I never got was occupation of the Philippines, just as a joke. We were there 29 days. If there were one more day, I would have qualified. Another 10 points. But, but we're in Lady Gulf, yeah. for, you know, for 29 days, and uh, my uh, my daughter in in Texas at that time, she was going with a young fellow. She didn't marry him, but anyway, he was a sailor, and he said, "You were on a carrier," and I said, "Yeah." He said, uh, uh, "Did you ever go on to Saratoga?" And I says, "Well, yes and no." He said, "Well." What do you mean, yes or no? He said, I'm on the USS Saratoga CV-60. They're putting her in mothballs out in, uh, in Texas. So I says, he said, would you like to take a tour? I said, yeah, sure. I said, I'd, I'd like to take a tour. It's an Essex-class carrier, same as mine. I'd like to go out and look around. So I got on, he gave me a cap. And I said, well, that's nice. So I used to wear it around once in a while. So USS Saratoga CV-60. So I was down at the Big Y or someplace one day, and a man said to me, he says, you want a Saratoga? I said, well, yeah, yes and no. He says, yes and no, that's a crazy question, a quite crazy answer. And I said, well, I said, I was on the CV-60, and I said, I was on the CV-3, the original the Saratoga. Original Saratoga huh? He said, where were you on that? I said, down in the Philippines. He says, yeah. I said, yeah, Lady Gulf. I said, we were down there for repairs, and I said, we were anchored out in the bay, repair ship was working on us, and right alongside of us was the Saratoga. She, she got beat up every time she went out. So as kids, we used to swim off the side of our ship, swim over to the Saratoga, get up on her. She had an armor plate about as wide as this table, you know. 
get up on the armor plate and dive off and swim. So I was on the search. On and off the search. Oh, yeah. Off, but yeah. You were a wetback. Yeah. yeah, and then, then when we came back uh, after the war uh, in uh, 46, we went up uh, in, uh, near Alameda Air Station. Anyway, we, we tied up there and we tied up alongside of the CV-3. And at that time, they were loading her with all kinds of trucks and tanks and, and uh, airplanes, cattle, sheep, oxen, chickens, everything. Oh, the and bikini they bit. They towed her down to Bikini, and she yeah. was a target ship for the B Bikini uh, atomic bomb test, yeah. What a hell of an end to a really good <laughs> ship, though, huh? <laughs> yeah, but we, uh, we took on another air group, uh, uh, VF-1, and uh, I was in VT-1, a torpedo group. And I did the same job with, with airplanes as I did, you know, with Air Group 82s, and I stayed with them right until the end of the war. And after we left, uh, after we left late, he left the Philippines, we went up north and out in the China Sea, and I was up around Formosa, and uh, we, were, we were out in the China Sea when, uh, when they dropped the atomic bombs. And I said, ah, oh, that can't be true. It can't be a bomb that big, you know, yeah. <laughs> whatever. But, it was. but we were out there, and uh, so then after they surrendered, and we were we were out, and we went into Tokyo Bay on September 10th, and uh, 1945, and MacArthur was there, Nimitz was there, and. Uh, I didn't see him because I was looking down at him. We flew over. We were in that air armada that went over the Missouri the day they were okay. they were, Fly they, by, were huh? they were they were they were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, at the Battle of Midway, George Gay, Torpedo Eight, he was the sole survivor, and they uh, they picked him up. He was in the water a couple of days, but. They picked him up and eventually took him back to Hawaii. He was in the IEA hospital in Hawaii, and Admiral Nimitz came to see him. And he says, George, he says, you probably saw more of that battle than any of my other sailors that were out there. Okay, he and he said, down. yeah, and he said, I want to know what did you see, and you know, the Jap ships were going by you and everything mm -hmm. else, and tell us the whole story. And the doctor said, I can't understand. He says, he's got all these wounds, and he says, they look like they're half healed up. And George said, of course they are. I was in a saline solution for about three days. <laughs> <laughs> a good cure for whatever yeah. ailed you. Huh? Oh, yeah. God. That's, God, that's great. When yeah. will you uh, finally, what's, I guess, uh, we can go on for hours like this, but there are a couple of things in here I'd like you to take a few minutes. And fly for boys? Example. Yeah. Just for yeah. kicks. Well, uh, I have some squadron members that signed this book, and I take this book with me when I go to different reunions. My son in North Carolina, he has what they call Brothers Weekend. He, he, the, the five brothers get together and they go to the NASCAR races, like they're, they're down to Biltmore, wherever they go, right? Boils. So they got this friend of his, uh, he has a friend of his, or a friend of all the boys now, Tom Thompson, and uh, he's retired from uh, Johnson Wax. He made a lot of money, politicians. And uh, so he gets them the tickets to go to the races. Gets them all paid for, the whole thing, gets a camper for him to park out in the infield and oh. whatever. So my son Rick says, you know, Tom, he says, uh, my dad was on an aircraft carrier during the war. He said, oh, was he? He says, yeah. He says, uh, yeah. He said, uh, what one was he on? He said, USS Bennington. Well, that's good. He says, you know, he says, my father's got this Flyboys book. Did he have guys sign it? And he said, uh, you know, some of the, the guys that were with him and whatever else says, yeah, yeah. He says, you know, one signature he'd like to get. He says, what? He says, George Bush. He said, I know George Bush. He said, no, no, no. He said, I, I mean George Bush. George you know? Bush. The old Bush, the old man, Bush, Bush. He said, oh, I know him well. He says, yeah? He says, yeah. He said, I'll see what I can do, see if I can get him to sign the book. He said, better than that, he said, I know the secretary in his office out there. And he says, maybe. He said, I could do something with her. So. Anyway, my son Rick 
down there says this is on February 6, 2006. He wrote a letter to Bush. Do you want to write it, read it? If you want uh, me to, sure. Yeah, would you please? Okay, yeah. with my good eyes. With All your right. good eyes, yeah. Uh, this is February 6, 2006, yeah. to President George Bush. Now, this is Bush the senior, not senior. Bush the junior. Senior, this is the okay, senior, the, yeah. We don't want to get bushwhacked. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My father was just 17 when he entered the United States Navy in 1943. He wanted to fly. He was a member of the Civilian Air Patrol and had a pilot's license when he was 16 before he even had his driver's license. But he couldn't pass the eye test, so he became a plane captain for TBM on the USS Bennington CB-20 Air Group 82. He loved airplanes and still does. So it was a natural fit, a plank owner. He was there when she was commissioned, and he was on the bend when she departed San Diego for Pearl Harbor on the New Year's Day, 1945. For my dad, like for many, the next 12 months were some of the most terrific, yet most formative days of his life. Those he knew aboard the Bennington shared something very special. It was a friendship and a bond that they would have for life. He's now 80 years old. These days and those friends continue to be part of his life. When James Bradley's book, Fly Boys, came out, I got an autographed copy for him. Little did I know then that what an odyssey that book would create. My dad recognized his air group and many of those who were part of it. He sought some of them out his book is now autographed by many of those who were there. His buddies and fellow plane captain, Joe Mager, VT-82, also 82, Lieutenant Lauren Kreck, VMF-123, pilot, Major Dwight Mayo, WMF-123, Rowdy Dow, and George Flasher were also Massachusetts boys. And my dad sees them often now. Many of these men were interviewed by Mr. Bradley for this book. Mr. President, I have four brothers and three sisters. Each one of us has a copy of the book with all the signatures. The book provides not only an understanding, but also a profound respect for those men, our dad included, <laughs> accomplished in 1945. I choke up a bit sometimes, okay? As my father celebrated his 80th birthday on February 27, 2006, one signature would mean a great deal to him. He was so proud to know that he had served in the same theater of war with you, sir, and your signature in this very special book would be a wonderful gift. I don't mean to be presumptuous in any way, but if you're able to sign the book, it would be meaningful forever. It was signed to Dick Smith, who helped to keep the flying boys flying. Thank you for your consideration, Dick Smith, Jr., North Carolina. That's the story. There's the book. And you have a picture of George, too, I believe. Yeah, well, let me tell you about oh, the book. Me. Yes, I'm my, sorry. My wife, unbeknownst <clears throat> to me, my wife sneaked the book out of the house. He sent it down, she sent it down to Rick in North Carolina, who in turn sent it out to Bush. And on my 80th birthday, they uh, said, come on, Dad, come on, we want to show you something. So I went in, and they handed me a copy, the, the same copy, a uh -huh. copy of that letter. They handed me that. And I said, I almost cried. I think I did cry. But then they said, come here, Dad, I got something else we want to show you. So if you want to. These are all the guys that signed my book. But this, this man took a whole page. He didn't just want to put a signature okay. on there. Well, no, he, he was the boss. Did you get a good <laughs> shot of that? Yeah. If you get a shot of it, I think you should read it to him. Okay. Please. You know, I pay extra for reading. I, I know it. I know it. <laughs> okay, let me finger the other way. This is the one right here on this side. No, the other side. Right here. Okay? All right. Well, there it is. Let me read it. It'd be a lot easier, I think. <clears throat> uh, to Dick Smith from Lieutenant J.G. George Bush, 
Avenger pilot aboard the USS San Jacinto, is that how San, you pronounce it? San Jacinto, yeah. Okay, my J's and H's in yeah, Spanish okay. no good. <laughs> VT-51, thanks for keeping MTBS in the air. George Bush, also president, USA number 41. And there it is. Yeah. Now, for those of you who would like to read the book, here's what the cover looks like. It's well worth reading. It gives you a good piece of information about a lot of guys who just did their thing. Okay? Yeah. Thank uh, you, sir. He also sent that to, yeah, no, to this, me. <laughs> this is young, young George many, many years ago. <laughs> that's, Try the this other, one. that's the other George. We don't discuss yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> now, all you good Democrats can take a real good look at this thing. There's a signature down there in the bottom if you can get it. Okay? So little Richard has had some fun. We thank you for that, sir. Yeah. Now, this is the good one. This is a good book. Uh, I'm just trying to think. It was a reunion, I think, about four years ago. It was out in California, Sacramento. And this lady, uh, she really haunted me for about three days. Her father was on the Bennington during the war. And she had this book. and. We'd sit down for dinner at a banquet or whatever, and she'd be at the next table and she'd be talking to me and she'd just say, Dick, well, what can you tell me about Torpedo 82? What can you tell me about it? And she showed me this book. And I said to my buddy, Joe Meager, who was playing captain with me, and Joe just passed away this past summer, but anyway, and I said, if I could only get that lady to let me borrow that book. I could get it to my son in North Carolina and he can get it copied mm. completely. He said, well, I don't know. I said, I think I'm going to ask her. Just before we got on the plane after we left the reunion to go back, or on the, the bus to go back to the plane, she came over and she said, well, it's been nice having to talk with you and everything. And she said, I'd like to present you with this book as a wow. gift. And I looked at, I've been through it many times, and I looked at the book and I looked at it and I said, well, yeah. Well, I almost, I almost cried that day too. So anyway, the story behind this book, which I found out later, and I'll go into that for you people. That, I gotta, I gotta find that picture in here somewhere because This book was printed by a man by the name of John Ream, and he was a big executive with Shell Oil. His son is one of the pilots that's in this book. He also survived, thank God. And his son made the remark, I hope that when all these flyers get out that they go to work for Shell Oil. Well, Ream had these books printed up, and my good friend, and I want me to hold this up, oh, but anyway, oh, yeah. Here's George Flashner and Rowdy Dow. This is when they're in training. Yeah, get this. And there we go. Well, a couple of years ago, I met with them and with our wives. We're at a restaurant down in Worcester. Here's Rowdy Dow. Here's George Flashner. This is my buddy Joe Meager, passed away, and that's myself. This picture was just taken a couple of years ago, but we finally met up after when George was in Rowdy were in training. But I got this well, book and I have this book and I've been through it and every one of these pilots and, and combat air crewmen are listed in here. So I got the book and I went down for coffee one morning down to Juice in Java and I met with George Flasher and a couple other fellows and I said, hey George, look what I got. He said, where did you get that book? And I said, well, it's a long story. I said, Kelly Metz, I met her out there in Sacramento and she told me the story as to how she got it, that one of the pilots had passed away in the meantime, and his wife talked to this Kelly Metz, and she said, George had two of these books. I'd like to give you one, you know. So I can't take No, I'd like you to have it. So anyway, she gave it to her. When I showed this book to George Flashner, and he says, where did you get that book? And I told him, he said, you know how many of those books were printed? And I said, no. He said, John Reams only printed two books for each member of the squadron, two for the pilot, two for the, crewman, the, yeah. the two crewmen. 
And so anyway, and he said, I don't know how you ever got that book. And I said, well, it just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And that, that's our squadron insignia on the back. Let me hold that up so you can, because this, this is history, folks, pure and simple. Almost looks like the old CB one, except for those. Oh, yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, does it? Yeah, yes, it and does. I admit to a prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. Thank you. Yeah. Now, talking about being at the right place at the time, you gave me a story a while ago. One of the planes came in, and you had a deep six over the side. Yeah. And they were having some kind of an inspection, and you were found to be in possession of something that wasn't really yours. Is that a good way to put it? Well, it would have gone in the drink, but it went into my locker. <laughs> it being what? And the, and the officer going, <laughs> going through it, he, he saw these two rolls of film in there. He says, where'd you get that? He says, that, that looks like gun camera film. I says, it is. He said, where'd you get it? I said, it was one of those F6Fs that we shoved over the side. Get rid of that. I said, <laughs> I'll tell you who it was. It doesn't mean anything to, except to us old timers. Buddy Hassett used to be a first baseman for the Yankees. Yeah. He was our educational officer aboard oh. ship. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. So you've lived through and made a lot of history, huh? <laughs> yeah, but but it's it, amazing how your fingers seem to get all kinds of souvenirs. Hey, no, let's, no, here we go. This, These are borrowed. This, this, yeah, I, I borrowed this from... Hold uh, it up so they can see it. Yeah, this, well, it's just my flight helmet and goggles. But anyway, they had a broken lens, and I talked to somebody, and they said, oh, there's a guy in Al Cajon, California, which is not next to San Diego, says he can probably give you the lens of that for him. And I says, all right. So I called him up, and he said, no. He says, I can't, but there's a man in Toms River, New Jersey, and he has all the World War II naval memorabilia. So I called him up. I finally got in touch with him and everything. I said, I need a lens. And he said, green or clear? I says, green. He said, which side? I says, port side. Or he says, OK, I can give you a new lens. But he says, you got to send the other one. Didn't get broke. Got to send that back. And I said, yeah, the face piece is all rotted out and whatever else and in age. He said, yeah, I got that too. I says, yeah, how much? $50. I said, ah. I said, they've got to be all rotted out. Like, no, no, no. He said, they're like new. So anyway, <laughs> I said, well, okay, I'll do that. He said, too bad you don't have the helmet. I said, I do have the helmet. And he says, you do? I says, yeah. He says, I got the helmet and earphones, everything. You want to sell them? You want to sell them? Yeah. I said, no, I don't want to sell them. I said, my younger son, Timmy, I said, he wants to be a Navy flyer someday. And I said, I'm just saving them for him for a souvenir or whatever else. He said, well, you know, he says, I was talking to Pappy the other day, and he says, Pappy says, I said, Pappy, he says, uh, yeah. I says, like Pappy Boynton? He says, oh, yeah, he's yeah. a friend of mine. I said, you got to be kidding. He said, no. No. He says, I uh, was talking. He says, uh, he says, George Gay. He says, you know George Gay? I says, I don't know George Gay, but I know who he was. I said, mm -hmm. he wrote the book Soul Survivor. He was a soul survivor, Torpedo 8, or Torpedo 8. He says, yeah. He says, I was talking to him, and he said, uh, so your son wants to be a naval aviator. I said, yeah. He said, well, he said, next time I talk to George, he said, I'll see if he'll uh, send him a, uh, a book. I said, yeah. Now he's really giving me a snow job. I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've heard those stories before. So. And you've told quite a few, too. <laughs> yes, yes, I have. So about a month later, this package about this size came in the mail to Tim Smith, and he opened it up, and it was Soul Survivor. And on the inside, it said, to Tim Smith, may your luck always be as good as mine was at Midway. Beautiful. George Gay. I said, Timmy, hang on to that book. I said, hang on to that, because someday it's going to be, you know, be worth something. And I, another thing I, I just wanted to show Bob, I showed him this the other day. This jacket is uh, close to 60 years old. I give it a coat of Lexol at least twice a year. I had this insignia and everything put on locally over at the, the shop over on Tyler Street. And the only reason I had that done was that the uh, I take this to reunion sometime mm -hmm. and I say, hey, I have to have it. Can you, excuse me, can you hold it up so that people can take a, yeah. a real good look at it? Yeah. And then the. Uh, And on the inside it says eight two four five six seven four four. 
Smith IRAs. Okay. That was my serial number. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Thank and you. so I got this when uh, when our torpedo squadron one came aboard. In fact, I got the helmet the same way because I did a little flying with them, not combat flying, but we went over while well, dropped uh, supplies to prison of war camps and stuff like that. But anyway, I said to this friend of mine, I said, you know, I'd like to get that jacket taken home. Of course, it's probably in the, the U.S. Of N. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> stolen who, from. That's <laughs> who it used to belong to. So, so anyway, I said, I'd like to get that jacket home. I said, but how can I get it out of here, you know, if it's on the ship? He said, I'll get it home for you. I said, okay. He said, it's going to cost you five bucks. I said, he said, never mind, give me five bucks. Yeah, don't said, ask, right, don't, don't tell. Ask, yeah. <laughs> so he went out on Liberty, like I guess we're in New York somewhere. <laughs> he came back and he says, well, got your jacket on the way home. He says, you owe me $5.10. I said, $5.10? He says, yeah. He says, here's the key to a locker over at Grand Central Station or Penn State, wherever it okay. was. He says. I had to pay 10 cents to get the key to the locker, but he says, when you go out on Liberty, he says, go over to the locker, and try get, it out, get your huh? jacket out and bring it home. But that that was a long time ago, and I think the Navy forgot they even owned that. Yeah, whatever. Well, they're probably just as glad you've got it. You guys are good, you're a good memory, let's face yeah. it. Now, yeah. let, let's, you've, when you were discharged, where were you discharged from? I'm Fargo not, Building down in Boston. Okay. Yeah. And then what? What was your uh, reception when you came home? Do you remember? It was good. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was good. See, we all, it was in 46, and uh, that was early 46, so a lot of the veterans that I came back with had to go back to high school and get their uh, diploma, finish mm -hmm. their education. Yeah. So I went back to the summer of 46 and finished that half of my uh, junior year, and then I went to uh, the class of 46 to graduate in 47, and that's when I went and I got my uh, high school diploma. And I hated school from the first day I went. I remember that. But when I went back after the war, and I went back to high school, and I got my diploma, and the man that had a lot for me to, to give thanks to was John Courtney, who was the sheriff of Berkshire County at that time. And I went to work for him, and he said, you're no dummy, why don't you go back to school? And I said, I don't know, John, I don't know. And he said, hey, you ought to go back. So BCC was on 2nd Street at the time, so I went down there, and I graduated with an associate degree but I graduated out of the new school because by then they had the new school mm, built on West, West Street. I yeah. went out there and I graduated. And uh, then he, Courtney said to me, what are you going to do now? I said, no, I'm all set. He said, no, no, no. Keep going. So I went over to UMass and I got my bachelor's degree. And then after that I said, I've had enough. And he says, keep going. So I went to AIC and I got a master's degree. Wow. And I hated school from the first day. <laughs> yeah, but you got back at him, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> for the first day I went to school, but yeah, yeah. he, uh, well, I, I say uh, Pete Courtney and, but, and my wife, but and Pete Courtney and I'd be out the night before, and uh, so it was Pete, you know, this, Pete, this, Pete, and the other. He'd come in in the morning, I'd say, morning, Sheriff, morning, Dick, how's everything? I'd say, pretty good, Sheriff. <laughs> he says, How's school? I says, pretty good. I said, got a big exam Friday. Oh, today's Wednesday. Go upstairs, go to your office, take the phone off the hook, lock the door, and, and study. Study, yeah. study, <laughs> study. And it was, he had an awful lot to, to do with me getting my college well, degrees. Good. Now, with all of these things that you've done and the places you've been, uh, would you consider or think that your time in the service was helpful in getting you lined up. Yes. What's yes, your I opinion do. of that right now? I, I, I think it taught me uh, responsibility more than anything else because I was responsible for that airplane and for those three people that were on yep. it. And uh, it was up to me to, to see that it got up all right and it got back all right and and uh, it was a 24 hour a day job. Yep. And I think it was responsibility I learned more than anything okay. else. And it's carried through the other kinds of yeah. jobs you've done? Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I worked 30 years in, in police work, and between being a policeman and then I, I worked uh, for, for Jan. Uh, this man came in sheriff's office one day, and he, he was, uh, his name was Denny Flavin, lived on Churchill Street. He was an agent in the ATF, alcohol, tobacco, firearm. And he said, uh, boy, he says, we're having problems down in Springfield. He said, with gun runners out of New York and Boston. Hmm. So I wish we had Dick Smith down there. He says, why? He says, well, Dick Smith knows this guy. He was a black fella, and he had a black gang down there that were running guns. So he says, well, he says, why don't you ask Dick if he could go down with you? Hmm. So he, he called me in the office and says, hey, Denny wants to know if you go work with him in Springfield for a while. And I says, yeah, sure, I, I guess so, what, what's up? So they said, well, want somebody to go down and work undercover. I said, sure, I'll, I'll okay. go down. I said, uh, hey, Pete, I said, how am I going to get paid? He said, I said, am I going to be a state employee, a county employee, or a federal employee? What am I going to be? Don't worry. Don't just, worry about just it. Just go down. We'll see <laughs> that you get your paycheck every okay. week. So, so I did. I went down, and I went down dressed like a bum, like a bum. And I walked into the federal building down there. Walt Brady was the the uh, FBI agent at the time. I said, hey, Walt, how are you? Is that going by? He says, pretty good. Where are you going, Dick? I said, I'm going to work with the ATF for a while. He says, okay, oh, I, oh. I'm, I'm going to have to yep. cut okay. it here. The man's flagging me okay. like mad. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. We could go on for a couple of weeks. Oh, Maybe I, we <laughs> can come back chapter two sometime and we'll get some of the other kids. But again, I know it. I know we it. thank I, you. And it's I, been fun, I, as you know. And, and I hope that what we've been able to share with people We'll give them an idea of what's going on. Again, for those of you who may be other guys from the Bennington, we're here, we're willing to help, we'd like to have you come and do your shows with us. If you got the idea, the address is on the board, and we're willing and waiting for you to come. Again, we thank you for listening, and I thank you, Richard, as a man says, there you're you still warm and healthy. You thank you. Vaya con Dios.